All right, I think we should begin. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, in our webinar today. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, please don't forget to mute yourself if you're not already muted. Um, you can ask questions after the talk. You can either raise your hand and then unmute yourself and ask the questions directly to Meg or you can type your questions also into the chat box during the presentation and then we will go through those questions after the talk. The presentation will be pre-recorded uh, but we will have live Q&A after the presentation and I also want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available for, for on-demand watching soon after the uh, session. And today I have a great pleasure to introduce our speaker Margaret Stratton to all of you. Margaret has been an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst since 2015. Prior to that, she was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, where she was already working on the ChemK2 protein complex. <laughs> so it's a long time friend for her. Um, she also, uh, during her PhD, was studying protein folding and protein sensor design at SUNY Upstate. Um, she has a wonderful story for us here to tell us. So without further ado, Let's hear her exciting presentation. Hey, hi everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Um, and thanks, thanks so much for the opportunity from Refine. Um, Gabrielle and Rhea have been super helpful setting this up. So I'm excited to tell you about some of the work my lab is doing um, on what I think is the coolest enzyme, CAM kinase 2, um, which is this oligomeric kinase that I'm going to tell you a lot about today. And as you can see from this movie, CAM K2 exists as an oligomeric complex. And so we've been using mass photometry to help, to help us sort out some of the biophysics um, underlying the really cool properties of this enzyme. So I'm coming to you from UMass Amherst, which is out in the western part of Massachusetts. Um, and hopefully it'll look a little bit more like this coming up soon as we get into springtime. So I'm gonna tell you um, how important CAMK2 is. And I think the this is really exemplified in the fact that um, if you make mutations in CAMK2, you get these really gross phenotypes um, in mice and in humans actually. And so in these two mice, um, we have a forgetful phenotype and we have a sterile phenotype. And underlying both of these um, seemingly disparate phenotypes is a problem in the same enzyme. And of course that's CAM kinase too. Um, CAM K2 or, or calcium commodulin dependent protein kinase two um, looks like this. So each subunit is comprised of a kinase domain, a regulatory segment, a variable linker region, and then finally a hub domain. Um, and in this regulatory segment, this is where um, there are three regulatory phosphorylation sites that are housed here. Um, and also in the regulatory segment is the calmodulin binding footprint. So if we just take a look at the catalytic part of the enzyme first, um, this cartoon kinase domain looks like every other kinase you've ever seen. Um, and of course, as mentioned, this regulatory segment regulates CAMK2 activity by um, blocking the substrate binding pocket in, in its off state. So if there's no calcium around, the regulatory segment will, will be bound um, and blocking the substrate binding pocket, thereby keeping the enzyme off. In the presence of calcium, calcium camodulin will bind um, to this binding segment, competitively binding that, that regulatory segment um, and opening up the substrate binding pocket, allowing for um, phosphorylation of, of CAMK2 itself, autophosphorylation, as well as many, many other targets downstream. And this first autophosphorylation event, 3 e 286 is, is quite a special um, phosphorylation event where phosphorylation here um, keeps the enzyme in an on conformation, even when calcium goes away. So this is quite a special attribute of CAMK2, where as long as 3 e 286 is phosphorylated, um, even when calcium calmodulin dissociates, there's still um, activity in this enzyme. So we get this kind of long-lived um, behavior um, in activity 
as long as that residue stays phosphorylated. And that's due to kind of steric interactions between negatively charged residues at the base of the sea lobe here um, and that phosphate group, which kind of keeps this regulatory segment from rebinding very strongly. And then we get these other phosphorylation events, 305, 306, which are actually in the calmodulin binding segment. Um, and these sites are really interesting and we know that they're important physiologically, but from a biochemical standpoint, a molecular standpoint, um, the function of these guys are, are still kind of murky. Okay, so I told you CAMP K2 also has this hub domain. The hub domain on its own organizes into this oligomeric complex. Um, here I'm showing you a dodecameric complex, but as I'll come back to later, we see actually different stoichiometries of this enzyme. <clears throat> so the hub domain is the oligomerization domain. It organizes um, into this nice little donut-like structure, and it kind of brings the kinases along with it. So the kinases um, in the full length CAMK2 holoenzyme are arranged as such kind of around this central hub domain. And we have one um, full length, uh, one crystal structure of full length CAMP kinase 2, um, which was solved by Luke Chow when he was in the Korean lab. Um, and as I'm showing here, one subunit of CAMP K2 um, looks like this, where we have the hub domain here in gray, the regulatory segment shown in these colors, and then the kinase domain shown in blue. I've highlighted the activation loop in green, just for reference. Um, and what you can see here is that the calmodulin binding segment, which is normally a full helix, is actually partially unfolded and packing against the hub domain itself. And so in this conformation, it's actually highly inhibited um, because of this interaction with its own hub domain. So two monomers come together to form this dimeric interface between the hubs, these, um, this largely beta-beta interface. And then six of these dimers come together to form a full-length holoenzyme. You can kind of see it looks a little bit like a flower, um, where again, the central hub in the middle here, the oligomerization domain, and then in this structure, the kinases are kind of splayed above and below the plane of that hub domain. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, CAMP-K2 plays a really important role in the body. Um, and what I mentioned previously is that we see these phenotypes um, of forgetful mice, um, because CAMP-K2 plays a major role in learning and memory and neurons, um, and also the sterile phenotype, because CAMP-K2 plays a major role in fertilization, in the very early events of fertilization. CAMP-K2 also plays a major role in cardiomyocytes um, by controlling cardiac pacemaking, and so mutations in CAMP-K2 can also lead to things like arrhythmias um, and other types of pacemaking effects. So it plays a really important role throughout the body. Um, <clears throat> and kind of interestingly, if you take a look at these three cell types, what I'm showing here is that they all communicate to one another using calcium oscillations. However, um, the frequency at which those calcium oscillations are delivered are quite different. So in neurons, we're talking about 50 to 100 hertz um, for an excitatory neuron to drive long-term potentiation. And cardiomyocytes are talking more like one hertz, so the heartbeat. Um, and then in eggs and sperm, so sperm actually, um, the fertilization event itself actually leads to calcium oscillations in eggs, which are required for proper em uh, embryogenesis. And these oscillations are really slow. So there's about one oscillation every 10 to 20 minutes or so. So vastly different timescales, but in the end, they're all activating the same enzyme on the other side. So it's kind of an interesting facet of CAMP-K2 biology that we're really interested in looking at. So in my lab, we kind of come at this um, from different viewpoints. Um, and so the kind of major projects that are happening in my lab are using CAMP-K2 biosensors, existing ones and ones that we're making ourselves. Um, we also started a recent collaboration with Gene Zhang's group um, to improve some of our sensors. And so that's been really exciting to kind of look at CAMP-K2 activity in these cell types and actually see what it's doing um, endogenously. Um, we also are, really care about um, all the different CAMP-K2s that are found in cells. I'm gonna talk about this today. Um, there are four genes encoding CAMP kinase 2, and each of these genes are alternatively spliced, um, leading to many, many different variants. And so that's been a big area of interest. Um, we 
uh, really care about this oligomerization domain, both from a biophysical standpoint, as well as a functional standpoint. And I'll talk about that today as well. Um, and then we have some structural projects where we look at CAN-K2 interacting with binding partners and kind of really try to piece together what it's doing um, in these different cell types to kind of manage all of the things that it needs to do to perform its functions. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna pare this down um, to these two topics for today. Um, so I can really highlight how mass photometry has kind of helped us think about the biophysics of this enzyme. So I'm gonna start off um, by talking about these CAMK2 sequences and how we're thinking about this, um, how we're thinking about tackling this. So as I mentioned, um, there are four genes in humans and mammals um, that express CAM, CAM kinase 2. So there's CAMK2 alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. And kind of canonically, um, we think of alpha and beta as, as the predominant neuronal um, species. And certainly these two are, are what drives CAMK2 function in learning and memory. So it's been shown very clearly. <clears throat> CAMK2 delta is primarily found in cardiomyocytes and really maintains this cardiac pacemaking role. And then CAMK2 gamma is found in eggs and in sperm, and it's also found um, throughout the body and muscle tissue. So kind of uh, a more realistic view is that um, we actually find all four variants expressed in the brain. Um, and of course their expression levels are likely different, but this has been a really hard thing to study, um, but certainly one of the things that we're interested in doing. So I'm gonna start by talking about um, some of the work we've done to kind of tease out what's actually happening in neurons, specifically in the hippo hippocampus in the brain. So kind of thinking about this forgetful mouse, um, I mentioned that this is a phenotype when you mutate CAM kinase 2. Um, and kind of interestingly, people have made mice, uh, transgenic mice, that have 3 ne 286 mutated to an alanine so that this, this really special 3 ne 286 um, which I mentioned lead, leads to um, autonomous activity. Um, if you mutate that to an alanine, of course, you can't get phosphorylation and you lose this autonomous activity. And so when you mutate this residue to an alanine, just in CAMK2 alpha in mice, you get this forgetful phenotype. Um, the mouse can no longer remember the maze as well. Um, it gets easily confused. These other two sites, um, which I also mentioned previously, 3 new 305, 306, um, if you make a transgenic mouse um, with these two threonines mutated to non-phosphorylatable residues, you, you also get a memory phenotype, but it's distinct from the 286 phenotype. So in these 305, 306 mice, um, they can remember the maze as long as you don't change anything. But if you change anything slightly about um, the visual cues or, or um, you know, where the treats are just slightly, the mouse gets easily confused um, and kind of thrown off track. So this is kind of referred to as a, as a rigid learning phenotype. Um, and so it's quite fascinating that making mutations in different parts of the protein lead to different phenotypes, indicating that, of course, CAMK2 is playing a major role in memory, maybe even playing multiple roles, depending on its phosphostate. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and we know um, many things about CAMK2 function in neurons. This has been a well, well studied protein in neurobiology for many years. Um, and to show you a very simplified version of a synapse, um, we have <clears throat> the axon coming in, synapsing with the dendrite, a dendritic spine. Um, glutamate is released into the synaptic cleft, binding to downstream receptors, allowing calcium entry. Calcium binds to calmodulin, turns on CAM kinase 2, CAM K2 autophosphorylates, and then it phosphorylates dozens of downstream sub substrates in this dendritic spine, including coming back up to the membrane, um, binding to NMDA receptor, AMPA receptor, um, stargazing, phosphorylating several of those targets, overall leading to increased calcium conduction um, at the synapse, which actually leads to strengthening of that synapse. So we understand these kind of cellular roles of CAMK2 and how it functions to um, increase long-term potentiation or LTP, which is the um, cellular mechanism of memory. 
But what we don't know is a lot about um, the details of this process and exactly which components of this are required for LTP. Okay, so these four um, human CAMPK2 genes are actually really highly conserved. So here I'm, on the left side, I'm showing you um, just the kinase domains. So just um, the kinase and, and regulatory segment, the catalytic module. And these are um, upwards of 90% identical to one another. So very few changes between these um, domains. There's a little more heterogeneity in the hub domain where we go from 70 to 90% identity over here. Um, but where there's the most um, variability is in this variable linker region, aptly named. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is, is the exon architecture um, of this linker region across these four genes. And so you can see that the exon architecture is actually quite well conserved. So we have nice um, boundaries between each of these exons. But the sequences of each of these exons um, are very variable between the genes. And then to add on another layer of complexity, we get alternative splicing um, between each of these exons um, in all of these uh, gene products, leading to um, upwards of 70 possible um, different variants produced from each of these four genes. So the diversity is kind of amazing, um, just encoded in, this, um, in these four sequences. So we were really wondering, um, you know, which CAMK2 variants are actually present um, in the brain. And we wanted to start with the hippocampus because that's the memory center of the brain. And so um, Roman Slutsky, who's a postdoc in my lab, um, who is helped out a lot by Rachel Bates, who is an undergrad in the lab and, and now has moved on, um, took samples of human hippocampus and amplified the CAMK2 variants to sequence them using Illumina. And just to show you briefly what, um, what they did, they amplified each of the genes using primers that were specific um, to each of these specific genes so that we would get four gene products. Um, and then we used Illumina sequencing um, paired end to read through completely the variable linker region so that we could really unambiguously determine um, which exons are incorporated in each transcript that we were sequencing. So here's kind of what that looks like. We um, generated four um, products and then using paired end reads, we were able to really unambiguously sequence this variable linker region in all four of these um, products all four of these libraries, I should say. So I'm gonna go through the CAMK2 alpha transcripts um, in detail because alpha is really kind of the, um, thought to be the, really the main player um, in LTP. And they're also the fewest of these transcripts. So um, CAMK2 alpha has these three exons that are possibly um, encoded uh, in the gene, uh, in the gene product. And so we sequenced, um, this no linker variant where all three of these linker exons are spliced out. So here's our no linker variant. Um, this had a, a significant number of reads, um, but only comprised about 3% of our, our total reads, but still a, a significant number for sure. And this was really exciting because actually the crystal structure is of this exact variant. Um, and prior to our work, it was not known whether this CAMP2 alpha with no variable linker at all actually existed um, in the body. And so it was really nice to kind of see that result and um, provide some, some additional credence for this crystal structure, for this confirmation that we see in the crystal structure. Um, the second version that we sequenced was this 30 residue linker. So this is where exon 15 is spliced out. <clears throat> and this 30 residue linker is, um, is the most well-studied version of CAMK2, most well-studied variant. Um, and as you can see, we also have the highest fraction of reads for this variant. And so clearly this is, is certainly the predominant um, variant. And since that is the case, we wanted to kind of dive in um, a little deeper and look um, 
look at this variant. So with this 30 residue um, linker version, we teamed up with Luke Chow, who um, now has his own group at MGH. If you remember, I, I mentioned that he is the one who um, solved that crystal structure. And so um, we brought him in to, to do cryo-EM on this CAMK2 alpha with a 30 residue linker. So those, um, those results are, sh are shown here, some of the reconstructions that we have. Um, so first of all, I just want to show you the 2D class averages, um, which kind of leads into this stoichiometry question. So in our 2D class averages, um, we see the hub domain just super clearly. And this is true in um, you know, all of the negative stain that's been done as well. The hub is just very, very clear um, in these types of studies. And similar to previous studies, we see two, two stoichiometries. We see six-fold symmetric um, hub domains, which would yield dodecameric enzymes, um, and seven-fold symmetric hub domains, which would yield tetradecameric enzymes. And again, this has been seen before. Um, the percentages that we see here are about 60-40. This is also kind of similar to what, to what others have seen um, in negative stain, um, as well as some uh, mass spec that's been done more recently. So from, um, from these class averages, we were importantly able to visualize side views. So this was really important because in negative stain um, and in cryo, as we've seen, CAMK2 is, is very um, orientation preferred to sit down uh, with, the, with the top facing, facing up like this. So this is the highly prefer preferred orientation. And in negative stain, it's almost impossible to get side views. So we were really happy to see that we could get side views here using cryo-EM, um, which would ultimately allow us to, um, to really make 3D reconstructions. So we see these nice side views. Um, again, the hub domain is super clear, but we also see density outside the hub domain, which of course corresponds to um, the kinase domains. And that's a little bit more clear here, uh, where we see additional density um, outside the hub domain, clearly corresponding to kinase domains, um, which we're really excited to see. So one of the reconstructions that we were able to make was actually um, exactly the confirmation that we see in the crystal structure. So what I'm showing you here in blue, in light blue, is the density from our cryo-EM. And um, inside that density is um, the crystal structure um, fitted inside that density. And so what you can see is the, a nice big blob of density for this kinase domain. And the kinase domain just fits really perfectly in there. And our cryo-EM resolution you know, is about 4.7 angstroms. So we can see that you know, this helix fits really nicely in there. And so we feel really confident about how we've docked this kinase onto the hub domain, which again recapitulates exactly what we see in the crystal structure. So this is really exciting because as, as I mentioned, the crystal structure was, um, was made using a construct which lacked any linker residues. So now in our cryo -EM experiment, we have these linker residues present and we're still forming um, this kind of docked conformation, which we refer to as the more compact confirmation of CAMK2, which is, again, highly inhibited. So that was really exciting to see. And then finally, the last um, version that we were able to sequence was this um, full linker variant where no exons are spliced out. So this is the longest possible um, alpha variant. We also had a significant number of reads um, for that one. Okay, so I won't um, go through these for, for all the four genes because that would be pretty painful. Um, but suffice it to say, we sequenced a lot of beta, gamma, deltas, um, which have a lot more exons encoded uh, in the genes, leading to many, many more splice variants that are possible. And so all told, we, we sequenced more than 70 variants of campkinase 2 um, in the hippocampus. So at least we know that transcripts are present there um, for all of these genes. In terms of protein expression, um, we are aiming to tackle that using some mass spec experiments, but unfortunately I don't have um, any data on that right now. So it'll be the, kind of the next project. So we wanted to um, assess some of these variants that we have now sequenced. And so Noelle Dietzik, um, who's a graduate student in my lab, along with Matt Dunn, who's an undergrad, 
um, set out to um, express, purify, and measure activation properties um, of many of these variants. So what I'm showing you here is kind of the experimental setup where we have um, KMK2 alpha, um, these two different variants, the 30 residue linker and the zero residue linker. And this is kind of a common assay that we do in our lab where we titrate calcium calmodulin and then we measure kinase activity against an exogenous peptide substrate. So what we can see is um, the reactivity of CAMK2 to the substrate um, as a consequence of calcium commodulin concentration. And um, what you can appreciate from this data is that <clears throat> the 30 residue linker is much more easily activatable compared to the zero residue linker. So it takes a lot more calcium commodulin to reach that easy 50 value for the zero residue linker than it does um, for this 30 residue linker. So that's really interesting. Um, and this has been shown previously as well. So we, um, we're just kind of recapitulating these results. So we see this significant right shift um, in EC50 EC value in KMK2 alpha when you delete that linker. So um, to add in here, the other variant of KMK2 alpha that we sequenced, this 41 residue linker um, looked very similar to the 30 residue linker. So not much of a difference between 30 and 41, but a big difference when you delete that linker region. So next we tested some KMK2 beta variants, which I told you we had many, many more of. And so I was kind of you know, daydreaming about these complex um, correlations we would see between linker length, composition, and EC50 value. And so we tested a bunch of these things and they all looked practically the same. So from a zero residue linker to a 200 residue linker, all of the EC50 is really crowded um, around this 20 nanomolar range, which again is very similar to what we saw for alpha with the 30 residue linker. So kind of the big surprise here was that deleting the linker in CAMP K2 alpha has this major effect um, of right shifting the EC50 value to a, to a really high calcium commodulin concentration, whereas deleting the linker in beta really didn't do much. And so that was kind of a big surprise, um, which is always exciting in science. And so we dived a little deeper into that um, to try to figure out what was going on. So we wanted to ask, you know, what's determining sensitivity here? Um, and if we think about deleting the variable linker region, we're really left with the kinase domain, the hub domain, or some combination of both. So what's determining sensitivity here? Um, and if, we, if I bring back these um, trees of divergence that I showed you previously, these catalytic modules are super, super similar to one another, whereas the hub domains are more divergent. And so we thought, okay, maybe, uh, maybe the answer is in the hub domain here. Um, and so if we take a closer look at this tree of divergence, you can see that KMK2 alpha likely diverged first. Um, KMK2 beta and gamma are the most similar to one another um, and have diverged the most recently. And then KMK2 delta is kind of somewhere in the middle. So since beta and gamma hubs are the most similar, we asked whether they would also have similar um, activation properties. And so we made all four versions of these proteins um, with zero residue linkers and measured their EC50s. <clears throat> and here are the results. So first I'm just showing you uh, what I've already shown you, which is that CAMK2 alpha has a significantly right shifted EC50 compared to CAMK2 beta. And again, our hypothesis is that since KMK2 gamma's hub domain is so similar to KMK2 beta's, <clears throat> maybe its activation properties will look like beta. And that's exactly what we saw. So KMK2 gamma with no residue linker um, also has this kind of left shifted EC50 value. And KMK2 delta, which is kind of in the middle um, of alpha and beta, has a, a somewhat right shifted EC50 value. Um, closer to that of KMK2 alpha. So it was really exciting and kind of showed us that the hub domain, this oligomerization domain, is potentially also playing a regulatory role, which was not really previously explored. <clears throat> so to kind of um, further dissect this, 
what we did was to make chimeric versions of alpha and beta, where we mixed and matched um, hubs and kinases to figure out if we could um, get one to shift one way and the other to shift the other way. So again, um, here I'm showing you the wild type data where CAMP2 alpha is really right shifted. And then we made these chimeric versions. So if we just take a look at um, this chimeric version where we put the CAMP2 alpha kinase on the CAMP2 beta hub, you can see that now alpha kinase activity is significantly left shifted. So when we put that alpha kinase on the beta hub, we recapitulate what we see in CAMP2 beta. And similarly, when we put the beta kinase on the alpha hub, now we get this right shifted effect where it really seems like the identity of the hub domain is driving how uh, accessible this kinase domain is to calcium calmodulin. So that was really an exciting result. Um, and again, kind of confirmed our idea that there's a role for the hub domain in regulation of activity. So of course, we would love to figure out the exact um, residues, the exact molecular mechanism kind of driving this. And if we take a look at the structure of um, the hub domain, here I'm showing you the structure of the alpha hub domain, and I'm highlighting the C alpha residues where there are differences between alpha and beta. So there are 31 substitutions between alpha and beta hubs. And if you take a close look at these, you can see that none of them um, really jump out as being like really obvious, um, huge changes. A lot of them are really subtle mutations. <clears throat> and so um, we kind of turned back to our structural studies, our cryo-EM, where we saw additional states um, that we hadn't explored yet or that hadn't been seen yet. And so here I'm showing you um, this state that I've already showed you, which is what we saw in the crystal structure, this kind of compact dock state. <clears throat> and the new confirmation that we observed was again, the kinase domain is docking onto the hub domain, but this time in a, in a very different orientation using different residues of the kinase and different residues of the hub. So what we can appreciate from this cryo-AM result is that the kinases are most certainly interacting with the hub domain. And through those interactions, um, through these different types of interactions, the accessibility of calcium calmodulin um, binding segment could certainly be affected by that, which would of course then lead to an effect in EC50 value. So just kind of thinking about how the identity of the hub domain can drive these activity changes. We think that the identity of the hub domain could drive different conformations of the kinase, thereby leading to different activation properties. And um, just to show you kind of a different contour um, of our cryo-EM reconstructions, just to appreciate that indeed there's, there are, um, there's density for several kinase domains um, in, in different orientations around that hub domain. And so certainly they are um, interacting with the hub. And again, this may affect the accessibility of the calmodulin binding segment. <clears throat> and this, this is why potentially the hub identity really plays a role in regulating activity. And, you know, coming back to the diversity that's encoded in this enzyme um, through this variable linker region and through all these splice variants, you can imagine the heterogeneity of interactions that are potentially possible um, in, in all of these different splice variants, leading to a really large set of regulatory interactions. And it's not um, so surprising that the kinase domain interacts with the hub domain. These domains have evolved together over a long period of time, and it would be surprising if they hadn't um, evolved ways to interact with each other as well. Okay, so next um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're thinking in terms of the hub domain acting as this um, dynamic regulator. So one of the things I've, I've kind of hinted at is, um, of course, this role of CAMK2 in the learning and memory. So we know that it plays a really important role. And one of, the, one of the things that got me really interested in this enzyme is this question, which is how do memories outlast the lifetime of proteins? So we can remember things for decades, and yet the components of our neurons, the molecular components of our neurons, are turned over um, at a rate that's significantly faster than that, 
right? So some proteins maybe stick around um, for a few hours, some proteins maybe stick around for a few weeks, but certainly they're not um, lasting for as long as a memory. So how do memories um, outlast these molecular events? And Francis Crick, towards the end of his career, um, you know, got bored after the whole DNA thing and kind of delved into neuroscience. And he published this um, thought paper in Nature, so you can do that when you're Francis Crick. Um, and what he, what he postulated was that potentially the answer to this question is a multimeric protein. Here I'm showing it as a dimer. This protein could be modified in some way post-translationally. And then when mixed with newly synthesized protein, you get a subunit exchange event leading to this heterogeneous complex. And finally, that modification could be shared with the previously unmodified protein. Now, this PTM, this post-translational modification would have to be important for memory formation in some way. And in that way, um, when you share with the newly synthesized protein, you get persistence of that molecular memory of that PTM. And later on, John Lisman, um, who's a longtime neurobiologist at, at Brandeis University, suggested that CAM kinase is a really good candidate for this mechanism because we know it's multimeric. We know a post-translational modification is crucial for memory formation, that 3 ne 286 and 3 ne 305 306 that I showed you. <clears throat> and so the thing that we don't know is um, whether CAMK2 exchange, exchanges subunits or not. So that was what I um, worked on during my postdoctoral work in John Curian's group, where I showed that um, CAMK2 does indeed exchange subunits um, with itself. And importantly, it can also spread phosphorylation in that way. So um, work in my lab has kind of expanded on this, thinking about the four genes of CAMPK2. I was predominantly working with CAMPK2 alpha with the 30 residue linker version, which as I mentioned is the predominant version of CAMPK2, but we were wondering whether um, all four of these proteins are able to exchange in the same way. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, so a graduate student in my lab, um, Ana Torres Ocampo, has been undertaking this um, series of experiments. And what she's done is to um, make CAMK2 gamma and label it with um, different fluorophores and then ask whether um, we get exchanged by looking at FRET. So if, if these two things are exchanging with one another, then these probes would eventually end up on the same molecule leading to an increase in FRET. <clears throat> and indeed, that's what she sees. So over time, um, active CAMK2 gamma starts to exchange with itself and unactivated CAMK2 gamma pretty much keeps, keeps on its own. So activated ones start switching subunits and unactivated ones um, stay to themselves. Now, really intriguingly, to look at um, forming heterooligomers, which we know exist, at least in the brain, um, Anna started mixing CAMK2 alpha with CAMK2 um, gamma and asking whether those exchange with one another. And indeed they do. So over time, you see that gamma and alpha start exchanging, whereas the unactivated one stays relatively to itself. So interestingly here, um, you can see that the, um, the amount of time it takes for exchange to occur is significantly slower forming these heterooligomers. Um, and if, if we kind of think about what's going on here, we're asking these slightly different hub domains to now form interfaces with each other. So it kind of makes sense that the process to form heteroligomers would be slower. So that kind of got us thinking about the energetics of this enzyme and thinking about what's driving this um, process, which has to involve disassembly and reassembly um, at some rate. And so what we did was to um, carry out some um, biophysical characterization of the enzyme. And so two undergrads in the lab, um, along with Anna, were purifying proteins. Um, and then Eddie Esposito from, from Malvern was um, helping us determine these melting temperatures using DSC. So if we measure the hub domain alone, the melting temperature is uh, pretty crazy, 90 degrees Celsius. 
Um, but if we add the kinases onto the hub domain in the holoenzyme, we significantly affect that TM. So we significantly destabilize um, the hub domain down to about 60 degrees Celsius. And interestingly, um, these, um, these stability properties kind of track with subunit exchange, which makes sense, right? So if we test the hub domain alone, there is no exchange. The thing doesn't fall apart, doesn't come back together, there's no exchange. But in the holoenzyme, when we activate it, we get exchange. And we know that um, from our structural studies, the kinase domain is interacting with the hub domain. And so clearly these interactions are leading to a destabilization of the hub um, in these thermal calculations. And that must be leading to um, destabilization in terms of um, disassociation. And so that kind of leads me um, to talk about our um, efforts in understanding the disassembly of the, of the holoenzyme. And that's really where we turned to mass photometry. And I just grabbed a figure from this nice science paper, um, which first showed this, um, this mass photometry result. <clears throat> so I was really fortunate to run into a, a rep from Refine at a protein so uh, society meeting. And this is really what started our endeavor into using this technique. And so essentially, I'm sure everybody watching this is familiar, but just, just in case, um, you know, mass photometry uh, basically allows you to measure the molecular weight of molecules in solution at a single molecule level. So that's really exciting, especially for the things that we want to do. And that was really nicely shown um, in this figure one from the science paper where they looked at BSA, which can form monomers, dimers, trimers, tetramers. Um, and they can visualize all of those species in this one experiment. So what you can see is that as the molecule hits, um, hits the surface, that um, scattered light is basically um, taken as an image and that is then converted into um, a molecular weight. And so what they were able to do um, was to, to, de uh, to determine the molecular weight of each of these um, different species from um, tetramer down to monomer. So with ChemK2, this, um, this works super well. So we've been using um, the mass photometry instrument that's housed at MIT, um, but luckily we were, we were able to just purchase one here. And so we're playing a bunch more experiments now. Um, so I'll show you what we have and kind of tell you what we're planning to do with this. So um, basically what we've done so far is to um, take different versions of CAMP-K2 and look at their um, distributions. And so what I'm showing you here is an experiment for the hub domain compared to the holoenzyme, where we have the kinases and the variable linker region present, and just, um, just looking at the stoichiometries. So we basically converted um, molecular weight into the number of subunits down here. Um, and what you can see for the hub domain is that it for, it's forming these really big complexes in solution, um, 16 mers, 18 mers. Um, and then of course our kind of cano more canonical uh, view of this, which is 14 mers, 12 mers. Um, so those are really interesting results um, and we're following up on that now. And with the holoenzyme, we kind of see more, more in line with what we've seen um, in cryo-EM, crystallography, et cetera, where the predominant species is this dodecameric complex. We also see some 14 mers, and there's also some 10 mers, which there's also evidence of um, evidence for in the literature. So that's kind of just looking at the stoichiometry, which is um, something really fascinating to me. And I think that these, um, the fact that CAMP-K2 can form different stoichiometries probably allows for um, some of its really unique biophysical properties, such as subunit exchange. So maybe if you didn't have these mismatched stoichiometries, one of which has got to be more stable than the other, um, maybe you wouldn't drive that interesting process. So the other thing we've been looking at is how this thing falls apart. And so we can take, um, for instance, the hub domain um, and make serial dilutions and kind of measure those dilutions using mass photometry and see what those masses are. 
And for the hub domain, which I mentioned has a melting temp of 90 degrees and also doesn't exchange, you can see that across the dilution range that we've measured so far, we basically see no dissociation. So this thing is super stable. It's staying intact, um, even down to like 10 nanomolar protein concentration. So we're planning to push this further to try to figure out um, what concentration it actually dissociates at, um, but those experiments are ongoing. And some of this has, has been published in protein science as well, if you, if you wanna read more about it. So for the whole enzyme, as I'm sure you could have guessed, um, we do see dissociation because this thing is a little less stable. We know it exchanges. And so we know it's gotta fall apart sometime. So what we see here is um, a nice peak for the holo enzyme at, at higher nanomolar concentration. And then at lower nanomolar concentration, we start to see this formation of this dimeric um, species. So this thing seems to be falling apart into dimers, which is also really interesting and correlates with other data that we have um, in thinking about this exchange process. But now we're looking at dissociation and um, I think this can tell us some really important things about um, not only how the protein disassembles, but also how the protein reassembles, which we know nothing about. Um, and so it's really cool that it seems like it's going from this holo enzyme and then at a certain concentration, it just dissociates into dimers. So there doesn't seem to be population at any other um, oligomeric state, which is really interesting. Um, so we're planning to expand these studies to look at all four variants of CAMK2 um, to measure the dissociation of each of the hub domains alone and then each of the variants um, uh, in terms of their holoenzyme uh, composition. And um, additionally, we'd like to look at different linker lengths to see whether that affects CAMK2 um, stability in terms of, of the KD of this uh, complex. Okay, so um, that was all I had prepared for today. And I'd really like to thank, of course, the, the people in my lab um, who did this work. I'd like to highlight Anna, who did all of the mass photometry work um, and really brought this, this project to light um, and kind of brought a new technique into our lab, which is always really fun. Um, and of course, I mentioned other people as, as we went along. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about everybody's uh, project, but hopefully we can... Um, we can get back to that at some point. And again, thanks so much to Refine. They've been such an awesome company to work with. Um, Gabriella and Matias especially have been super helpful to us like in getting things set up, um, especially since we've had the instrument here now, they've been just super helpful in, in getting us um, going with these experiments. So super thankful to them and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike. That was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and uh, um, I remember the day when um, we met at the Protein Society meeting <laughs> and we started to talk, uh, talk about your project. And uh, I, because we were being a new technology back then, I remember you had many questions and concern and kept coming back to my boots. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, asking your question, so that was that was a good experience to uh, to be, and I'm glad that now you you have your own mass photometer, and then it was wonderful data what you just uh, shared. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I I want to open uh, the floor for questions. Uh, we had a couple of them already coming in through the chat. Let's just start with that. One is from uh, Martin. Was there anything you did see to see more of the side views in cryo-EM? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the answer is not really. We tried different uh, freezing techniques, different plungers, um, and we always saw some subset of side views. So I think it's really just freezing in ice versus using uranyl acetate, which um, kind of just forced that preferred orientation. And even in cryo, we still see that preferred orientation, but at least we're able to observe these side views additionally. Thank you. The next um, is, uh, is it possible that dimers are an artifact of dilution for the mass photometer? Yeah, that's a great question. And we are, um, one of the things we need to figure out about this experiment is, how to stabilize these smaller species. Of course, since CAMK2 preferentially forms this oligomeric structure, it doesn't really want to be um, in these lower order structures. 
And so I think we need to figure out exactly what buffer composition to use in order to stabilize uh, these dimers or potentially other species as well. So it's a great question and something we're looking into. But additionally, we know that, um, for instance, if you put CAMK2 at a low concentration and in non-equilibrium conditions, such as a gel filtration column, we actually see the presence of, of what would correlate with a dimeric species. So we see some additional evidence for that as well. Next question is, um, have the chimeric structure been crystallized? No, um, yeah, we are. So the, the structure of, of CAMK2 crystallizing the whole enzyme is, is quite a, a feat. Um, but I think we could probably try to crystallize the chimeric versions with no linkers, which is really what facilitated that, that first structure that Luke solved um, as a graduate student. So that's on the list for sure. All right, another one uh, is how about in silico work? Has there been any MD work done on this complex? Yeah, we, um, I've actually t talked to a few people about doing um, some coarse grain simulations since it's such a large complex, it's kind of a beast to work with in silico. Um, so potentially coarse grain is kind of the way to go if we want to look at disassembly um, dynamics. But yeah, in short, um, there's not been a lot of MD done on the full length holoenzyme. Okay, uh, another one from uh, Rodrigo. Do you obtain thermodynamic data only with mass photometry or can you obtain kinetic data as well? Yeah, so, sorry, what do you mean about the kinetic data? Well, I don't know if you want to unmute. Yeah, you can just unmute yourself and uh, Ask the question to clarify. No? Okay. If you later do that, you could clarify on that one. If you just please unmute yourself and then um, clarify. We move to the next one then. Um, uh, how did you decide the range of uh, molecular weight for each conformation? Range of molecular weights. Um, I mean, we, so in the plot that I showed where we converted molecular weight into number of subunits, I think that's maybe what you're referring to. Um, we just let the data drive that. So um, we kind of picked concentrations to start at where we expected to see holoenzymes present in terms of the hub and the full length. Um, and we just let that we let the mass photometer tell us what the molecular weights were, essentially. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, one from Andre about uh, uh, experiment. Uh, would experiments similar to the mass photometry experiment be possible with dynamic or multi-angle light carrying uh, technologies? Yeah, we have also done um, DLS uh, in malls on CAMP-K2 over the years. And that definitely gives some information about molecular weight distribution, but I think the mass photometry data is, is a lot nicer and gives a lot more information in terms of the number of molecules that are at that molecular weight and just kind of giving a cleaner result of, um, of this single molecule information rather than looking at the distribution in these ensemble type measurements. Um, but one of the last ones, um, this is very inspiring work. I should read all of those comments as well for you. <laughs> if, stoichiometry, if, if stoichiometry is concentration dependent, would you have any idea about the cellular concentration of the various isoforms such as estimated by the mass photometry? Yeah, this is a great question and something we're really interested in. We are planning to tackle this using mass spec, as you suggest. Um, you know, in dendrites, it's estimated that CAMK2 comprises 2% of the total protein that's there, which means it's probably present in high micromolar concentrations, which is pretty crazy. Um, but we don't know the variant composition of that at all. And so we are currently planning out how to tackle that using mass spec. Right. Um, and the one last question is, at which temperature you did the dilution experiment? Yeah, these were all done at room temperature, so around 20 degrees Celsius or so.
Thank you for the amazing talk. This is the <laughs> uh, best examples of a multi-plot from biophysics that I've seen. Thank you, Akash. Um, <laughs> certainly, it's such a complex um, um, protein complex and such a, so much var uh, variety what it can do. Um, I'm sure you went through to your experiments and your uh, research, all the different uh, <laughs> techniques that you could. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, with very low concentrations. Um, yeah, how, how could you uh, get uh, high uh, data from much higher concentrations if uh, mass photometry does really low concentration measurements? Yeah, we, um, we were kind of playing around with this, you know, when, we, when Anna first started doing these experiments. So she, she started titrating down to see where the mass photometer would give us the clearest results. And so at least with CAMK2, we can go from nanomolar concentrations. And then importantly, we can go down to picomolar concentrations and just collect for a longer period of time. So I think that's the really cool thing about this instrument where you can cover this range, especially if you're like us and, and want to look at a dilution series of a complex for example. So it de probably depends on the protein and, and maybe Gabriella can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think certainly there's a kind of a large range you could probably collect data from. Yeah, so um, our concentration range is from 100 picomolar to up to like a, a one micro a uh, 100 uh, nanomolar is kind of what our range is. So while you could go that the picomolar range, um, I think most of our measurements are done in the 50-ish nanomolar range. And as Max, uh, uh, Margaret said that uh, depending on your sample, you could kind of play around a little bit with the, with the concentration, but it doesn't have to be picomolar. We, I would rather say one nanomolar and, and depending on your sample, you could have a little bit more flexibility there. Um, okay, next one, calcium effect or influence on these multimers. Yeah, we haven't tested that, but that's a great question. So it's certainly the th one of the things on our most immediate list to do is to look at what happens when you activate CAMP-K2, you increase the dissociation rate um, or not. And my guess is you probably do. Okay. Um, another question from Andre, I can take that. What are the current limits on mass resolution? Um, our mass photometer uh, specification is uh, between 40 kilodalton to 5 megadalton. Uh, we probably can go higher than a 5 megadalton. There's not a really strict uh, limit on the higher molecular weight. 40 kilodalton is definitely the smallest thing. What we could see uh, below that, um, it just gets too close to the background for us to, to see. All right. Um, Couple of more questions coming in. Do you plan to do your experiments also at 37 degrees? Uh, so that is the body temperature. Um, yeah, I think for now we're, we're still kind of planning to stick around room temp, um, but we could certainly think about increasing the temp and seeing how that likely you know, changes the KD. Um, but yeah, we haven't done those experiments yet. All right, um, seems like the question slowed down and then we hitting the one hour mark for our webinar uh, as well. So I think this could be a good time to stop. I wanna thank uh, again, Margaret for giving us this uh, wonderful talk and showing us these great results. I was really glad to see your publication out last year. So uh, if anyone wants to see the publication, it's out there and uh, feel free to contact uh, my, uh, Margaret about um, more questions if it comes in the future. And also I mentioned that we recorded this webinar, so it will be available on demand um, shortly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>